right. Well, we're going to get started here because Dudu is very impatient and she wants to uh, get the program off and going. And welcome to everyone. Uh, those who will join us, we'll welcome you. And today we, we have the great uh, pleasure of being uh, joined by a team who've been at the front lines of uh, responding to the situation in the world around rabies. Today is World Rabies Day. And as the world deals with the pandemic caused by a coronavirus, uh, we mustn't forget that there are many other viruses out there in the world. And you know some of them have been causing trouble for a long time, others are newer. But we're really uh, excited that all of you have been able to join us and to learn about how using a grassroots campaign, a collaboration between many different people from around the world and within Kenya, uh, including support from our mascot here, Dudu, uh, have been able to respond to you know, this crisis that's kind of overlooked. Uh, rabies is a neglected tropical disease. We'll hear more about it from our panel. But as, as we're, we're getting going now, I'm going to call on everyone to just do a little bit of an introduction about themselves. And so I'll start with, with me. So I'm Dino Martins. I'm the director of Impala. This is Dudu. Uh, and we've been really honored uh, at Impala to be able to undertake uh, you know, science, education, and conservation, and really engage with communities and use science to solve problems. And so today we're going to learn uh, from some amazing people, and, and I'm going to let them uh, introduce themselves. So we'll start with Dedan, Dedan Gatia. Uh, Dedan is a, a PhD student and candidate, as well as a scientist who's worked with Impala for some years. Welcome, Dedan. All right, thank you, Dino. Hi, everyone. So again, as Dino has said, my name is Didan Gatia, and um, uh, I mean, I've been at Mpala for five, six years now. I think first, first time I came to Mpala was to study my uh, for my bachelor's pro, uh, research, and then I went ahead to work on domestic dogs uh, for for my masters. And actually, that's that's the source, or rather, the genesis of what we'll be talking about today, which is the rabies vaccination campaign that I initiated. But I mean, across all those years, I've worked on wild dogs, African wild dogs, which is what I'm working on right now. I think I've done that for the past three, four years. And what you're doing is protecting wild dogs and protecting so many other carnivore species from disease outbreaks and or and and, and other viruses. So. Currently, I'm a PhD student. I'm almost getting to my second year of my PhD at the University of Wyoming. And uh, I mean, that means I will be stationed at Mpala working on wild dogs and helping with disease eradication for the next three to four years, which, which, which is great. So looking forward to a, a good one hour of conversation and uh, getting and to learn and to understand our work and how we can all work together towards rabies eradication in Laikipia and in Kenya in general. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dedan. Uh, Dishon, Dishon Muloy from the Instant International Livestock Research Institute is here with us as well. Dishon, if you would like to introduce yourself. Hi, Dino. Hi, everyone. Uh, as a from Dino, my name is Dishon Muloy. I'm a veterinary epidemiologist working at Tilbury. And uh, at Tilbury, I work on various projects investigating uh, zoonosis, which is disease transmissible between humans and livestock at the human livestock interface. Uh, at LRVC, um, I'm one of the founding veterinarians, so I was lucky to provide my expertise as a vet to, to, to the group. And I'm looking forward to engaging with all of us regarding rabies and how to control it in this uh, key day, which is World Rabies Day. So thank you so much, Dino, and looking forward to the chat. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, well, and welcome to Dishon. I'd like to invite Dr. Maureen Kamau to give us an introduction. Maureen is one of our fellows at Impala and a vet, and she's been with us for a couple of years uh, through the Smithsonian KWS Impala partnership. Welcome, Maureen. Uh, thank you, Dino. So as Dino said, my name is Maureen Kamau and I am a wildlife veterinarian and researcher based at Impala Research Center. I am currently pursuing a veterinary research fellowship in One Health with the Smithsonian's Global Health Program in collaboration with Mpala, Oljoki, and the Kenya Wildlife Service. 
On my fellowship role, I conduct 12 life clinical interventions and uh, I also undertake research into wildlife conservation and emerging infectious diseases at the Human Wildlife Interface. Um, and one of the highlights of my fellowship position has been the chance to be involved in One Health initiatives, such as the Laiki Perebis vaccination campaign for three years now, since 2017. So yeah, happy to be part of the panel. Thank you, Maureen, and welcome. We Thank also have, thanks to technology, two international guests joining us from across the ocean. And I'll start with uh, Dr. Scarlett, Scarlett Magda, who's in New York, I believe, and uh, with Vets International. Welcome, Scarlett. Thank you. So I'm uh, an emergency veterinarian uh, here in New York who's very passionate about raising awareness of One Health initiatives, the, initi the um, intersection between human and animal health, and of course, the environment in the middle of that. So um, I also run Veterinarians International, and um, as we've learned through the COVID-19 pandemic, disease and need knows no borders. So 60% of human infectious disease comes from animals. So we have to have healthy animals if we wanna have healthy people. And by building capacity, which means um, enabling at-risk communities to have the knowledge, skills and infrastructure available so they can then offer enhanced veterinary um, and healthcare services, we're able to change the world. And this is the core of what Veterinarians International does. We provide veterinary aid and education to underserved at-risk communities around the globe. We're six years old, um, just had our anniversary last week, and we have five programs in six countries. We're most known for our Asian Elephant Conservation Program, which is in uh, Sri Lanka at this time. We're partnered with the Department of Wildlife Conservation, a uh, government entity, to build Sri Lanka's first uh, elephant hospital. And the reason is because of human wildlife conflict. And uh, this is not only in Sri Lanka, this is in every single country, including your backyard. Um, here, our biggest issue is um, deer overpopulation because we've exterminated their, their natural predators. And so um, the, the same concepts that you're battling in your backyard are in every country. And um, not every country has the capacity to deal with these issues. And so this um, panel is a perfect example where we need interdisciplinary collaboration. In Liberia, there are chimps being uh, trafficked for pets. Um, Michael Jackson had a pet chimpanzee and um, those are not appropriate pets. So uh, people are um, killing the families of chimps and the, the babies are left uh, for the trade um, or for, for food. And so we partner with Liberia Chimpanzee Rescue to provide immediate aid and food for these uh, confiscated chimps. And um, our Healthy Pets program, which is currently in Kenya, Chile, and Guatemala, is providing veterinary care and education to low cost uh, to um, impoverished families so they can receive care at a, a low cost. And this is where our uh, rabies prevention program is uh, in partnership with uh, this particular group here, um, Lake Hippia, uh, L LRBC. And I'm a little groggy because I did work in the emergency clinic last night till two in the morning. So I apologize if I'm not quite as sharp as I <laughs> would like to be. And um, that's, uh, that's basically Vets International and I'll talk more about our involvement at LRBC later. <laughs> thank, thank you so much, Scarlett. And, and we know how hard vets work and you're on call 24 seven. So I know whenever anything happens with Dudu, I'm calling the vet, whether it's the middle of the night or on a Sunday, it doesn't matter. So thank you for joining us today. <laughs> And finally, I'd like to welcome uh, Adam Ferguson, Dr. Adam Ferg Ferguson, who's joining us all the way from Chicago. Adam is currently at the Field Museum as a scientist, a mammal scientist, but has extensive experience in Africa and has, is one of the co-founders, along with Dishon and Dedan, of the Lycopia rabies vaccination campaign. Welcome, Adam. 
Thanks. Thank you, Gino. Thanks, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be part of this prestigious panel and to, to be able to talk a little bit about the LRVC. Uh, I know the theme of One Health has come up and some people might be asking, what does a natural history museum have to do with One Health? And uh, so I'm kind of wearing two hats. I've got my logo here now at the Field Museum. I'm the collection manager of mammals here. And um, part of what I'm really excited about and one of the things I love about the LRBC is its diversity of partnerships from veterinarians to ecologists to wildlife biologists to social scientists and, and natural history museums as well. So we do a lot of work with One Health, even though it, it may not be as clear. Um, we do, we have several projects right now on coronaviruses and bats that we're working on. Uh, we do a lot of surveillance and biodiversity work, but the LRVC is kind of one of the, the flagship projects. And um, I think partially just to explain how uh, I got into this, I have a few slides I was gonna share with folks, um, just a little bit about how I got involved into this. Um, so let me try to share the screen real quick. All right, hopefully you can see the screen there. So uh, th this is a very diverse initiative with uh, partners and, sorry, let me get the slide. So we're gonna talk a little bit in a few minutes about the science behind the LRVC and a little bit about this paper that we just recently came out. And as you can see, it's a huge team. Um, it's a strongly collaborative effort and uh, as Dino mentioned, Dishon and Didon were the co-founders and co-lead authors on this pit manuscript, as well as many others that contributed. But before I get into that, I just wanna, how did someone who studied skunks in Texas for my PhD go to vaccinating dogs in Kenya? And uh, part of that explanation is, I, I think I describe myself as a scientific mutt. So I've studied everything from lizards to skunks to cactus uh, across my degrees at these three Texas institutions. Um, I also tend to chase interesting scientific questions, whether they're what I'm supposed to be working on or not. And then I'm also obsessed with field work, especially international field work. So I was really fortunate to be able to combine all these into a National Science Foundation postdoc where we were supposed to look at um, uh, the role of small carnivores and disease and parasite transmission across the human wildlife livestock interface in Lycopia. Um, this was in collaboration with Dr. Paul Wabala, who at the time was at Caratini University and, and Didan Agatia, who were the major partners in this project. And so we were interested in kind of filling in the gap with small carnivores, because we know a lot of work has been done on large carnivores in this system, but what role do mongooses and genets shown here um, have to do with it? And then Didon for his masters decided to kind of fill in one other gap, which is how domestic carnivores might interact with these wild species. So the question then became, how do we collar domestic dogs? And how do we set up a study to, to monitor the spatial ecology of domestic dogs, which was Didon's thesis work? And that's where um, I've dubbed the mastermind and the enabler. Um, the mastermind behind the LRVC was Dr. Dishon Malloy, shown here with his Coca-Cola uh, beverage of choice. And uh, Dishon was the one who suggested, well, if we're gonna collar dogs in the communities, maybe we could vaccinate them against rabies as a, as a benefit to allowing them, us to study them scientifically. Then he actually thought, well, maybe we should actually make a vaccination campaign out of it. So we approached Dino, the then director of, of Impala, and you can see in the lower right, that's our first group in 2015 when this started. And, and Dino was on full support and willing to have Impala take on as, uh, as the supportive institution for this. So just real briefly, I'm sure most of you know about this, but it, it wasn't hard for Dishon to convince me to kind of do this once I realized what a problem rabies is in, in the parts of Africa where we were working. So we know that 95% of the nearly 60,000 deaths occur in Africa and Asia, and this disproportionately affects rural populations and children, and 99% of those cases are attributable to domestic dog bites. So basically that was the impetus for the, um, I think Dishon has some more on the origins, but the impetus of the LRVC, and it was very fortunate we were able to partner with the Kenyan government very early on because a year before we decided to initiate the LRVC, they had initiated a strategic plan to eliminate human rabies from Kenya by 2030. That's, that was my whirlwind introduction, so. <laughs> Thank you so much, Adam. And it was it's wonderful that you've both been able to combine your love of fieldwork and of science and of small carnivores and big ones 
uh, <laughs> as part of the LRVC and everything that it's accomplished. So what we're going to do now is give uh, the three sort of pioneers, the founders to, uh, of the LRVC, a chance to tell us some of the science and some of the both exciting side of this as well as some of the challenges in informing this and leading it and explaining, you know, why is it so important that science leads, but that we also do this in a way that's collaborative, that's really engaged with community, and that is bringing together so many different stakeholders that a big part of the energy and effort required is managing that partnership and managing all those complex dynamics and to, to really solve any real problem in the world. Uh, today, we're going to need to work together. And we need to be able to listen to each other, to hear each other, to share as scientists, you know, that sense of wonder and excitement and knowledge that we have, but to share it in a way that we can also listen and learn from others and that makes our science better. And it makes our relationships with everyone better. And, and actually, it makes us more effective in whatever we do. And so one of the things I'm really proud of with the LRVC is that it has pulled off this incredibly complex, organic, evolving partnership to tackle this really serious issue. So welcome to Deden, Dishon, and Adam, and we'll be hearing from them for a few minutes, and then we'll, we'll hear from Scarlett and Maureen. And then we welcome everyone to ask questions, and we'll have a bit of discussion around that. So thank you. Handing over to you, Deden. All right. Uh, thank you, Dino. I think I'll also go ahead and, and just um, just share a few slides that I have with me. But basically, um, what I'll be doing is mostly talking more on, um, uh, on how the campaign came about, maybe a few details to what, uh, to what, to what Adam mentioned. But also mentioning a little bit of why we came up with this idea as allow also addition to talk more on uh, on the vet side of, of the campaign. So uh, I don't know if we've mentioned this, but when we came up with this project of, of the vaccination campaign, we had a big goal. And our big goal is that we knew rabies is a, it's a virus that's affecting lots of people, affecting lots of livestock. And you know, when you're talking about like EPA, livestock is like the backbone for the economics of this region. So we knew that if we put our efforts towards tackling this virus, then in a way we will be enhancing, protecting and conserving wildlife, talking about endangered, endangered species and also protecting people from this, from this virus. And Adam has mentioned that it's a virus that is killing lots of people, not only in Kenya, but also in so many other places. So we based this project at Mpala Research Center, which is like a center of Lake Ipia. And our goal is let's move to all the communities in Lake Ipia. Let's go and attend to all the people, get all the dogs, conduct mass vaccination of domestic dogs with the goal of achieving 70% coverage per, per area, which probably we've not managed, but that's a goal for the next few years. And we brought huge big teams. But one of the things I wanted to mention is that the success of this campaign is because we've based this campaign on volunteership. Basically, we are bringing lots of students from Karatina University and other places to Mpala. We are bringing lots of vets, national aid to Mpala, and lots of so many other volunteers. But the most important point is that none of them are paid. So we are working with volunteers with a goal of offering free rabies vaccinations to a lot of communities. And this has been the unique thing about our campaign because we have lots of other campaigns, but the volunteership uh, um, uh, deal with us has been really successful. It's been helping us cut uh, cut lots of uh, uh, lots of uh, pr cost, etc. But most importantly, is that it's been an avenue for students, for vets, and for so many other people to practice and to learn about not just conservation, but about how we can work together as a team with us with a common goal and and, and get that to succeed. So. Um, We've, we've had lots of, lots of supporters in our work. 
uh, starting with Mpala, who's been so generous with uh, with with lots of things that I can even mention about so many other partnering organizations. But I think it's also important. I mentioned briefly on how our campaign has grown from a campaign funded through online funding to managing to bring lots of uh, partners together. So within our first and second years, we realized now there's no way we are going to eradicate rebasing like if you're rather there's no way we'll have a future with a campaign if we are depending on online funding and we decided to reach out to people reach out to partners and that has been one of the biggest successes that we've had being that we've managed to come collaborate with international organization like the veterinarian international we've managed also most importantly to work very closely with the county government of lake Ipia, who I mean, the vet division is what is the division mandated to er eradicate rabies in, in Lake Apia. Working closely with them, working closely with the zoonotic, uh, zoonotic disease unit, the national government. And I mean, to a point that Lake Apia is almost one of, uh, of, of, of the pilot studies for the North Eastern, North, North, uh, North Eastern, uh, Northern counties in Kenya, sorry. Um, but I feel I should mention a little bit on how we've 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 built the campaign for the so many years. So, like Ipia is very unique, counting on the coexistence between people, wildlife, and livestock. I mean, the closeness of people, how people close, uh, how people are close to wildlife, how people are close to livestock. It's a big problem when you think about rabies as a virus. Rabies is a virus that affects all warm-blooded animals. What I'm saying by that is that rabies can jump from a domestic dog to a cow, from a cow to a human being, and so it's a burden. And so when you're talking about a region with such huge coexistence, then it was a good idea to start this process of, uh, of trying to see how we can eradicate this virus. And I don't want to go to the details of how I was working with my master's project. Adam mentioned that actually Adam was my uh, master's supervisor. And when you're doing that, so when you realize, oh, I think rabies is a big problem here, and we decided let's let's bring people together, let's work as a team, and let's see how we can work closely with everyone to see if we can protect livestock, um, uh, humans, and 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 wildlife. And that again brings in the whole idea of one health, where we are working to protect all these species. But one of the most important things I want to mention that I'm working on the African wild dogs. African wild dogs is one of the most endangered species. I think it's the second most endangered species we have in the whole world after the Ethiopian wolves. And this specific species has been threatened because of two things, infectious disease and persecution by people. Rabies has been the number one cause of wild dog mortalities in Lycopia in Africa. And so our goal with the campaign is yes, lots of people are dying. We need to protect people. Lots of livestock are dying. Livestock is a livelihood. We need to protect the livelihoods. But also, we are very lucky to have some of the most unique and some of the most peculiar species in Lycopia. And our goal with the campaign is to ensure that we protect all these and work towards their conservation in a way that we'll, we'll have them in future. So I know. I know uh, Dishon will talk a little bit about the vet side of this, but I just want to mention to people that domestic dogs are very important and that's how we built our work. We built them on domestic dogs by the understanding that if we work directly on domestic dogs, we might actually be saving so many other species, including people, including endangered carnivores, including herbivores as well by just vaccinating domestic dogs. So, in a place like Lake Ipia with lots of pastorates, lots of uh, agricultural activities going on, people mostly depend on domestic dogs for guarding, for security, for those purposes. But I think moving forward in this conservation, conversation, sorry, we want to be thinking about the, the conservation implications that can be brought about by domestic dogs. And the most important thing we're talking about here is rabies. Domestic dogs, they are the key reservoirs for rabies vaccination. And that's why the whole talk of mass vaccinations against domestic dogs can help eradicate rabies. That's what we've built our work on. And that's what we've been doing for the past five years. That's our goal for the next few years, partnering with lots of organizations, 
uh, working with lots of like-minded like-minded people specifically focusing our work on domestic jobs but also doing um, so many others so i don't want to go into details of rebase adam mentioned that that it kills lots of people in fact i think we are trying to do some analysis and we figure out initially before our campaign rebase was killing between 25 to 30 people in like it kills 2000 people in kenya every year but in like it's between 25 and 30 people but i also want to mention something being the number one cause of African wild dogs dead in Kenya and in Africa, specifically in Lake Ipia, rabies was killing, is, has been killing close to a hundred wild dogs a year. When we are talking about a species with only 600 packs remaining, which is approximately 6,000 individuals remaining, then deaths of a hundred individuals is a big deal. So that's our goal. We are wildlife ecologists, we are conservationists, we want to protect people and we want to protect livestock and also the uh, and also, also lots of animals. But just I'm sure this will be discussed more broadly. Lots of questions on how successful have we been? Have we managed to reach out to as many people as we have wanted? I'm sure that discussion will be will be will be coming on. Also, we'll be talking briefly moving forward on matters one health. Uh, how are we working on wildlife, which is what I've based my conversation on. We are talking about dogs, we're talking about lions, we're talking about cows, and we want people to be smiling. We want people to be happy with the knowledge that they know what this is. And uh, and also, as Adam has said, we'll be talking more broadly on our contribution to science, counting on the first paper that uh, that 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 we recently published. So yes, that's what I wanted to mention. I have a photo of the African wild dogs and also a photo of domestic dogs because they're my two favorite species. And these are the two species that I've, I've been working in in Lake Ipia for the past um, five years. And it's been great that we've managed to come up with ideas and projects can, that can work in a combined way to help um, to help protect uh, protect many other species that we have in our landscape. So I think I'll allow Dishon to take over from that. That was just a more broad discussion, but Dishon can talk more on the vet side. Uh, thanks, Dishon, uh, for that lovely introduction. So I'll briefly walk us through a few aspects regarding the science and also the veterinary side of things. And just to remind us that today is World Rabies Day. This is a day we we celebrate or discuss the whole agenda of rabies eradication from, from the world. And the target is that by 2030, we will have zero deaths or human deaths due to rabies. And just to remind us again is that rabies is 100% preventable, mainly through mass dog vaccination. And this is where we target the virus at the reservoir, which happens to be the domestic dog. As we word from Adam and Didan is that rabies, is, uh, rabies in Africa specifically is is entirely, or let me say almost entirely, dog mediated. So by, by handling the virus in the animal reservoir, which is a domestic dog, will be able to eradicate the virus from the human population. So um, you would you'd wonder why, why invest so much in mass dog vaccination as opposed to just vaccinating humans? And that's a good question because uh, you could full say that let's vaccinate all humans against rabies or let's treat humans once they get the infection. And remember, rabies is one of the oldest diseases we face as a, as a race, and rabies is, is almost 100% fatal. That is, the, the moment you show the first sign of rabies, you are most, you're 100% certain that you're going to die. And by eradicating this virus from the dog population, we are able to save so many lives in, in the human side. And you realize that uh, the vaccine coverage or the vaccine cost in human, in human population is is a lot more expensive compared to the, to the dog population. It, it costs um, less than a dollar to buy a vaccine for, for, the, for a dog as compared to, when you compare that to the human vaccine, which costs up to $100 in, in some of those uh, local areas. And again, the other issue is accessibility. Someone residing in a very local village in Northern Kenya, they may not be able to access the vaccine, hence the need for controlling this particular uh, virus from the dog population. And that's the, basically that's the mantra of, of uh, LRVC, which is basically, which is probably aiming to develop a sustainable partnership amongst uh, ranches, communities, uh, NGOs, government, government partners to eradicate dog mediated rabies using three main things. One, minimal cost. Two, 
science-based vaccination, and then importantly, community engagement. So I'll, I'll briefly walk us through some of those aspects, the first one being uh, the issue about science, and realize that uh, for anything to be successful, as we've seen with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic at the moment, uh, countries which put science in the forefront, they were able to, to manage this issue a lot more better than those who did not. So for us as LRVC is that science is, is at the core of this particular uh, campaign. And a few, there are a few things we've been discussing through the, through the last five years. And I'll just briefly walk us through four of the main aspects. And the first one is, how can we prevent uh, this virus or eliminate it fully from the human population? Is it, is it a possibility, first of all? Are we able to achieve the proportion then and mentioned of 70% coverage in the, in the animal population? And that number is a magic number in the sense that the moment you achieve, if you vaccinate 70 dogs out of uh, 100 dogs, I'm sure all of us now have heard about the, the herd immunity story from COVID-19. And the same, the same principle as applied in rabies, that if you vaccinate 70% in a way, in a population, you'll be able to manage this particular, particular uh, problem. So we've been trying to understand, is it possible to actually eliminate this problem from dogs and eventually in humans? And we'll hear a lot, uh, a lot more about that in a few minutes. Then our second scientific theme is that, how are, we, how are we able to reconcile or fuse community dynamics or expectations and the rabies campaign? As you'd imagine, rabies is a social, social disease in the sense that it affects dogs who are mostly kept by young boys in the villages, and then uh, it goes all the way to affect community members. And people, people, people love their dogs in these populations. How are we able to fuse some of these community expectations with the rabies campaign? How are, we, how are we able to get community buy-in for people to accept, people to jab their dogs? Can you imagine someone showing up in your, on, your, on your door in the morning and they come with a, with, a, with a syringe to vaccinate your dog. So we're trying to understand how we're able to fuse in the community. And we'll hear more later about how we've been trying to engage the community through several aspects. The first one being community outreaches. We have a school program which is trying to help kids with, with understanding rabies. And then thirdly, and we'll hear more from uh, my colleague Maureen, is about awareness. So rabies is the quintessential, or one of the quintessential diseases which uh, tackles, which needs to be tackled through the One Health bespoke approach. And that's simply because this is, is an animal disease or it affects dogs, but then eventually ends up in the human side. And for you to be able to, to tackle this uh, issue, you need to be able to look at it from all the spheres. And the human side, the social aspects of that, uh, the economic aspects of that, uh, and the, in, the, in the animal side as well, it also affects wildlife. So there's a lot more when it comes to one other aspect when it comes to rabies, and we are trying to address that. In the last few years, in the first few years of this project, we weren't able to get buy-in from the human side, that's the medical uh, side. And then I was glad to see that in the, in the successive campaigns, we were able to get someone from the, from the Ministry of Health, and that was a really good uh, success for us. So, so far, we've been able to manage to get veterinarians, uh, uh, medical doctors, ecologists, social scientists, and all that. So that's one of the successes, and we'll, we'll hear more from Maureen on how to talk about the one health aspect. And then lastly, it's very important for us to look into the future. So taking the long view. So taking the long view for us as we see, we would like to see how are we able to improve the vaccine coverage from the current 50%, 40%, some of the community, 70%. And then secondly, ensuring sustainability. It's easy to do a project, but then it's, it's important for it to be a mainstream project within the, the government circles. Because again, remember, rabies is a public good. Unlike, something, unlike a disease like um, uh, foot and mouth or Newcastle disease, rabies is a, is a public good. Uh, the people affected may not see the need to prevent it. So the government needs to come in. So we are trying to understand how we can be able to bring in the government and even importantly, ensuring that we educate the future generation about how to handle this, this problem. So I think I'll, I'll stop there and I'll hand over to my colleague, um, Adam, and then I'll come back later to explain to you some of the challenges we faced during this uh, uh, campaign. Over to you, Dino. Thank you so much, Dishon. And uh, Adam, we'll let you go ahead and then come back to, uh, to some of the next questions. 
Great. Thanks, Didan Dishon. Uh, thanks, Dino. So before moving on, I just want to highlight this is the paper again that just came out and you can see from the author line and there are 14 institutions on the author line. So I just want to acknowledge, obviously, we might not get to every person personally, but everyone on this paper contributed either through science or helping coordinate volunteer efforts and and doing that. So and, and not everyone that helped with the campaign was on the, the paper. Obviously, we had over, I think it was 120 volunteers in our last year. So um, I just want to take a little bit of time, let you look at that. And if you have questions about any of the folks or other organizations, uh, we can hope they address them. So thanks to the whole team. So just briefly, Dishon and Dion highlighted about it, but I just want to talk a little bit about the, the objectives were to basically develop a volunteer led campaign to vaccinate dogs against rabies. And one of the key aspects is that no charge to the owners themselves, right? So this is a free of charge vaccination campaign because there are studies that have shown that pay for vaccine campaigns don't always work. We also wanted to compare methods across different community types and then evaluate the effectiveness of, of a grassroots vaccination campaign at eliminating rabies at, at the population level or the Lycopia County scale as, as Dishon mentioned. Um, so there were three kind of major aspects we wanted to evaluate from the scientific side is, is our ability to achieve this 70% coverage rate, the cost per dog vaccinated, because that's a big tell about whether or not we'll be able to continue this and the kinds of funds we need to successfully eliminate it, and then the number of animals uh, vaccinated across these different areas. So we've heard a couple of times about the 70% coverage and this magical number. It's somewhat uh, similar to the P of 0.05. It's, it's not always the exact number. Sometimes you can achieve coverage or effective coverage at lower or higher rates, but 70% is the benchmark for basically creating herd immunity. So we've heard a lot about this in regards to COVID-19, but also in terms of rabies. If you can get, as Dishon said, 70 to, of, out of 100 dogs vaccinated, Consistently for multiple years, you have a high chance of eliminating the disease at the population level. Because basically, even though there's not all dogs vaccinated, those that are surrounded by so many that are vaccinated, they can't transmit it and the virus no longer um, can persist because it's R naught drops below one. So this is a map of the, the three years that we analyzed for the data. The campaigns have been going for five years. Um, and so you can just see that we started kind of small, especially around Impala in 2015. Um, and then each one of these dots represents a vaccination center. So we tried to use a combination of static point where we have centers that people bring their dogs to to be vaccinated. And then a little bit of door to door, which, which is part of our, we'll discuss a little bit later with, in terms of different strategies. But as you can see from 2015 to 2017, we were able to expand into all three sub counties of uh, Impala, or sorry, of Lycopia County, and a total of about 17 communities uh, as loosely defined. Um, the names aren't exactly for all those communities, but that's how we define them in, in the paper. And perhaps this image gives you a little better indication of, of the amount of dogs vaccinated within each area. You can see in some areas, especially the, the rural pastoral communities, we had less number of dogs vaccinated at these static point centers compared to those in these uh, peri-urban or urban centers around the town of Nanyuki and Rumaruti, for example. Um, you can also see in panel D there, that's a depiction of the H HRSL sediment layer, which was a, a, a satellite derived metric of basically what they thought were homesteads. So you can see we still have, uh, there's a large correlation between the number of dogs and number of people in an area. And in, um, what is that, Western Lycopia, there's still a lot of areas that we need to get to to, to achieve this coverage. So briefly, I just want to go over the vaccination campaign costs, and I'm not going to go through every uh, thing here. There's just a few key points I wanted to point out. So we were really fortunate to have large amounts of in-kind contributions. This, it came almost entirely from Impala Research Center in the form of vehicles, lodging, food. When you have 120 volunteers, you have to find places for them to stay, feed them, get them there. So we had a huge amount. So you can see with the in-kind contributions, the cost per dog was a little bit under $4 USD. Um, which is about on average and range with what most costs are, it's, although it's a little less. If you drop those in-kind contributions, it jumps almost double to about eight USD per dog. And if you remove the in-kind or, the, or the volunteer time, which is estimated at an hourly rate, it goes to almost four times, uh, excuse me, three times that amount to almost 13 USD. So this just shows a little bit that the, the volunteer and in-kind contributions were huge in terms of keeping our budget under control and allowing us to sustain the campaign. 
Um, we talked about comparing among the different kinds of communities. So we dubbed pastoral communities um, versus agro-pastoral communities. And so pastoral communities are defined as those that don't have some level of permanent agriculture. And um, you can see that the cost between those two different community types is about three times difference, uh, three times higher for the pastoral communities at almost $10 per domestic dog compared to a little under $4 USD in the pastoral communities. And this just has to do with the spatial spread of the communities and how they work, and also perhaps tied to the static point center approach. But basically you have to cover a lot more ground and spend a lot more money to receive coverage in these pastoral communities versus these more sedentary communities. So just some major conclusions about the paper. If you're really interested, I, we can share it and you could read the whole thing <laughs> for the details. Um, so one of the things we found that vaccinating more and more dogs each year was relatively easy goal to achieve. And it wasn't without its challenges, but basically adding more dogs just meant going to new communities and having larger teams and larger time spent in those communities. However, the achievement of the 70% coverage rate was, was much more challenging and only occurred in a few communities throughout the year. And this was hindered by several factors, including the, those listed here. Um, and part of it is, is a volunteer run team is limited in how much follow up it can do um, throughout the campaign. So this kind of led us with the question of, you know, should grassroots campaigns focus solely on local positive impacts? Because every dog we vaccinated in that community is a dog and human and wildlife protected because that animal becomes uh, resistant to the disease. So it's not that it doesn't have benefits, but can we actually achieve elimination at the population or landscape scale? And, and the question is, it, it kind of depends the answer. So what about the LRBC? Uh, we're kind of at this critical threshold where we've gone from little under 800 dogs vaccinated in 2015 to 14,000 last year. So that's a total of almost 40,000 dogs that have been vaccinated at no cost since 2015. So it seems possible that we could scale this up and that obviously increasing the number of dogs is, is happening, but whether or not we can achieve it, eliminate it at the landscape scale requires a lot more resources and a little bit more um, strategic effort. Uh, Dishon and Dion mentioned already the volunteers. This, this campaign would not be possible without volunteers. That was part of the grassroots component and part of the aspect of, of its success. So we've initiated that. And then also expanding partnerships. So we had you know, a lot of institutions early on, but we've constantly added and partnered with new, new partners, including Veterinarians International. Uh, Mission Rabies, which is a UK nonprofit, has um, worked with us to develop use of a rabies app that allows us to collect data in, in real time and more effectively. In 2015, we were using paper and clipboards, and by 2019, we have smartphones with every team collecting data that, that we can see in real time. And expanding partnerships with other organizations, including the Smithsonian's National Zoological Park, and then uh, critically, the, the Lycopia County government and the National Government Zoonotic Disease Unit in Kenya. That's all, all I've got for this, the five, seven minutes of science. <laughs> Thank you so much, Adam. It's been excellent to hear from Dedan, Dishon, and Adam. And I just want to emphasize again, this is this wonderful partnership between science and outreach. And so both are able to proceed hand in hand and to be very effective in terms of being an intervention on the ground. We have two more panelists we're going to hear from. I'm going to call on, on Scarlett at Vets International to tell us a little bit about Vets International and their international perspective on this kind of program and engagement. And then we'll hear from Maureen. Welcome, Scarlett. Thank you. <clears throat> so our mutual goal um, between Vets International or VI and um, LRBC is to vaccinate all the dogs. Um, we've learned about how much it costs to vaccinate a dog, but let's look at this on a global scale. Annually, we're talking about $124 billion that rabies costs the global economy to treat. Prevention, we're looking at $8 billion, just a fraction of that cost. So clearly, let's start making wise, smart decisions and focus on prevention. It's been concluded that the most effective way to uh, eliminate and control this virus is through vaccinating dogs, as, as um, has been mentioned before. But we can't just vaccinate the dogs. We must 
add education to that. And as we all know, knowledge is power. So as I mentioned before, 60% of human infectious disease comes from animals. And one of the, the biggest um, issues with how it's, it's um, happening is, is through hygiene and unsanitary living conditions. So part of Vets International's uh, partnership and goal is to create this humane education program and also look at other partners who can address uh, the, the sanitary issue. So um, we're fortunate here to be living in a clean home with access to uh, safe and clean food. Uh, most people in the world are not. And so uh, one of the uh, ways in which disease spreads is through uh, fecal oral transmission. We're talking about parasites, viruses, and bacteria that are in the ground. And when you have children playing in the ground, they put their hands in their mouth. And it's uh, one of the clear, uh, easiest ways to get disease. And so um, when you're looking at rabies, you got to address other issues that are involved. We can't, we cannot have a ton of uh, uh, a blinder vision where we're just focused on one thing because that's not how the world works. We, we must look at the bigger picture and be realistic of what are the issues the community is facing. So do they have access to uh, clean bathrooms or, or even bathrooms. Uh, many people are just uh, defecating out in the field um, as well as the animals. And so that's something that, that needs to be considered and addressed. So our big goal is to bring a humane education program that focuses on kindness and compassion to animals. Why? Because it brings forth a sense of love, joy, and stewardship for all life. And once you start to raise your consciousness in this framework, you're able to make these connections that I'm talking about, which is a historic way of looking at the world, which has kind of been brushed aside in the last couple hundred years where um, human medicine and animal medicine have been separated. Well, with the COVID pandemic that has affected every single person on this planet, it's clear that we have to go back to the uh, original ways of uh, Hippocrates, where we're working together. So our um, uh, goal is to bring forth this humane education program and also help on the veterinary side with population control. So bringing spay and neuter veterinary services in the, in the future. And that way we're able to arm the community with knowledge and um, help increase the bond that they have with their dogs and decrease um, other diseases. Uh, I just wanna leave the conversation with the uh, big picture of, of why we're in this pandemic in the first place. And to remind us all that we all have a responsibility to help this planet. The borders that are around you are meaningless. They mean nothing. <laughs> it's clear that disease will go anywhere. So it's time to start looking at the, at the, the world as, as one unit, one planet. You cannot just focus on your own country. And by clear cutting forests and setting up agriculture right next to a forest, that is how these diseases are coming out because the diseases live in the forest. And so when we're inappropriately interacting with wildlife and animals and how we're, we're, we're keeping them uh, inappropriately in stressful conditions, disease is emerging. So this is where going back to kindness, compassion, and empathy to animals, create stewardship will help create a better life for both animals and people around the world. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Scarlett. So finally, we were going to, we're going to hear from Maureen. And one thing with Maureen is Maureen has been at the front lines uh, with uh, handling both livestock and wildlife and responding, both as a scientist as an, and as a vet. 
after we hear from Maureen, we'll go into uh, questions and, and we'll call on our panelists to respond to those. We, we probably won't get to everyone's questions, but we will follow up with you if we don't get to your question. Welcome, Maureen. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dino. So I'll be talking about the one health aspect of the Lycipia like, rabies vaccination campaign. And to start with, um, so one health recognizes that the health of human beings, animals, both livestock and wildlife are linked to even the environments that they share. And with the one health approach, um, it focuses on a multidisciplinary effort to address health issues, economical issues, basically um, to come up with holistic solutions to you know, the problems that we are facing in our current day. Um, so the rabies, rabies in itself as a disease and the like keep your rabies vaccination campaign is a perfect example of um, the One Health approach. Um, as my colleagues uh, Dita and Dishon mentioned, uh, 59,000 of human deaths are currently attributable, all over the world are currently attributable to rabies, particularly in Asia and Africa. And in Kenya, 2,000 deaths um, annually are attributable to rabies. Um, so rabies is a disease of warm-blooded animals and affects both wildlife and livestock. And um, the situation in Laikipia is very unique because Laikipia is a biodiverse region and hosts uh, the globally important African wild dog population, as Didan mentioned, amongst you know other wildlife carnivores and um, of course pastoralists who graze their livestock alongside the wildlife and other human population. So in Africa, we are aware that uh, domestic dogs are the major reservoirs of rabies. And so vaccination of domestic dogs will contribute to the protection of um, human health, livestock health, wildlife health. So, you know, basically contributing to the health, you know, bringing out the one health aspect of protecting human health, domestic animal health and life and wildlife health. And as Dino mentioned, the beauty of the LRVC is, you know, the multidisciplinary approach. Um, so we have been working with ecology scientists, epidemiologists, for epidemiologists, volunteers, and veterinarians. And also of note is, um, you know, with the like keep your rabies vaccination campaign, it gives us the opportunity to go out into the communities and you know engage with them uh, to increase dog, you know, responsible dog ownership and even increase awareness in case of um, rabies outbreaks or even how to respond in case of a dog bite. Um, so the One Health approach also cuts across, you know, economic and social aspects. Um, so as um, Adam mentioned, you know, the vaccination of a domestic dog can range between four to 13 USD, but, you know, in case of a, of a human bite and um, acquisition of a human anti-rabies vaccine, you know, that's, that's a bit more expensive and ranges between, I think, 150 to 150 USD. So really vaccination of domestic dogs is much cheaper than, you know, human vaccination. Um, and with rabies vaccination in our domestic dog population, we are also protecting the livelihoods of um, pastoralists who rely on livestock. Um, and, you know, and of real note is we are also protecting our wildlife um, population. Um, and to conclude, the beauty of this conversation is, you know, it, it allows us to bring out the, you know, the holistic aspect of um, health, you know, the whole, it, it helps us bring out the holistic aspect of health in the sense that, you know, we're not just talking about wildlife as sources of disease, but then, you know, we are talking about how to protect all, you know, all animals and, you know, thinking of wildlife as part of, you know, our environment and even as part of we human beings and, you know, animals in our environment. So, yeah. That's all from me. Back to you, Dino. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Maureen. And 
thank you to our incredible panel for the insights and experiences that you've shared. We have a few minutes uh, left and lots of questions, so we're not going to get to all of them, but uh, some of the questions are very um, straightforward. You know, our, one question is, are we going to have the campaign this year? And the answer is yes, absolutely. We still are figuring out how best to do it so that we can respond to the current COVID pandemic. So we're not going to have mass campaigns, but we will have mobile campaigns and we are starting those up in the next uh, couple of weeks. So yes, we are doing it. Um, one interesting question that has come up is a question about distemper. So distemper is another virus. It's actually re related to the measles virus that infects people. Uh, and distemper did kill African wild dogs and endangered species most recently in 2017. Deden, would you like to maybe briefly talk about distemper? Like, yeah. Thanks, Dino. Um, so I'll talk about a few things. And one of the things is that, as Dino has mentioned, this canine distemper virus, it's a virus that, it's, that, that kills carnivores only. So it doesn't kill herbivores. It doesn't kill uh, uh, any other species, just kills carnivores. And that's why it's called canine distemper virus. So one of the things is that there's a huge, uh, or rather there's no enough information on the dynamics of canine distemper virus. And we've, uh, we are working on a few things on canine distemper. We are trying to figure out how we can vaccinate domestic dogs, if it's important, if it's not important. Uh, we're also trying to come up with questions on uh, if we cannot vaccinate domestic dogs, what else can we do? But just to go back to that is that even though, as Dino has mentioned, the canine distemper virus wiped out, we are, we are saying almost to extinction the African wild dogs population in Laikipia. And actually just to mention that the population of wild dogs in Laikipia was the fifth largest, fifth to sixth largest population of wild dogs in the whole world. One of the best thriving populations, but it was wiped out by the virus in maybe two to three months. But you know, we're still trying to figure out how to eradicate uh, canine distemper virus and like rabies, where we already have information on mass, uh, mass vaccinations to do that. So there exist no control measures as we talk right now. And actually there was a paper that came out in 2012 that showed that vaccinating domestic dogs against canine distemper virus does not really protect all the other species, unless rabies, where we know that we can vaccinate domestic dogs against rabies, and by that uh, we are, we are wiping out uh, we are wiping out rabies. So three things are happening right now from our studies. We are collaborating with some scientists from Namibia and South Africa, and the whole goal is trying to see if we can vaccinate wild dogs themselves to help. Uh, to help the, the virus from spreading. So no information exists right now. Some of the people who really understand CDV know that we had a mass, a crazy outbreak between 1994, 1996 around Serengeti National Park. I mean, they followed it back and the source of the virus was from domestic dogs going through small carnivores, hyenas, then to lions. But again, contrary to that, We've shown that again, it came from domestic dogs, but even though we, pro we vaccinate domestic dogs, we are not really sure that we are protecting our other species. So I'll say it's a complicated virus, a virus that we've not done a lot uh, at the moment. But the thing is, we've shown that canine distemper came in like in 2017, but it is gone. And like rabies, which has been persistent for all those years. So no much information on Kennedy distemper virus right now. Probably in the next two to three years, we'll figure out uh, what to do. But I'll tell you, the goal at the moment might be to vaccinate wildlife itself against the canine distemper virus. But more information will be coming soon. Yeah, I hope that Thank helps. You. Thank you so much, Deden. Uh, we have so many amazing questions and unfortunately not enough time, but we will follow up with you. Thank you so much for attending today and thanks to our panelists for their very, very amazing input and Dudu wants to say thank you as well. And so uh, 
We will continue connecting. Please follow us through social uh, social media, and we will get uh, Sheila will get back to you uh, through some of our links. The paper is available online. And we look forward to a great campaign this year. And please join me in saying Asante. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. Uh, due to that includes you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>